Hello students, this is Professor Paul. Uh, today's lesson, today's lecture is going to be about close reading, which is that process of close analysis that we started on last week that you worked on in your response and analysis papers. And this is really the most fundamental skill in the study of literature, so we're going to be spending a lot of time in this class focusing on it. So today what I'm going to do in this presentation and in the other one that I'll post later this week will essentially be a sort of basic uh, close reading or beginning close reading of uh, a couple poems or some sections in the poem so that you can follow along and see how the process is done and that way it's a sort of model for you to follow when you are working on your own analysis papers. And so the text I'm going to be working on today is the poem To His Coy Mistress by Andrew Marvell. So what is close reading? Well, the name kind of gives it away. Um, it's a form of reading, right? So we know what reading is, but it's close. So, you know, imagine a sort of physical closeness. Imagine that you're putting your eyes right there up close to the paper. Um, what does that imply? What sort of attitude does that imply? Well, it means that you are focusing on detail, focusing on the specifics. So it's about paying close attention to the text. Now again, as I said, close reading is the foundational technique of modern literary study. It's what all literary critics, no matter what their particular school of thought or what their training or what type of literature they study, it's pretty much foundational to just about everything that literary critics do. And again, this is one of the most powerful tools and one of the most important tools that you can learn in a literary and in a literature class because close reading is something that you can apply to every text, any and every text. Close read a speech by a politician and you will learn a lot about what's really going on in that politician's mind and what they're thinking and the way they're trying to appeal to their uh, uh, supporters. So close reading is very important. Again, the emphasis here is on detail and the particular rather than the general. So this is also why I'm having you do your analysis papers where you'll be doing usually a close reading after you've done your response papers. The response paper is where you sort of think in general about the story. The close reading or the analysis is where you focus more specifically on a small section of the text and really dig into it. So emphasis on detail, particularities, specifics. When you're close reading, what are you doing? You're paying very close attention, again, to the individual words, the phrases in the text, the syntax, that is the way the sentence is structured, what's the grammatical format, and every other aspect, any other aspect of language use in a text. So it's really how are the words on the page being used and how does the way the, the sentence, the line, the phrase, how is the way it's written important uh, to creating meaning and looking at those specifics and it gets this specific as saying well if you put one word in front of the other it's a different meaning than if you switch the order of those words so it's very detail oriented and the purpose of close reading is to we often use the metaphor of unfolding or unpacking the text and think about what that means when you unpack your suitcase what are you doing well you've got all this stuff in the suitcase right? It's all compressed in there. You open the suitcase, you unpack it, and now you've got all those individual items that were compressed into one small space. Now you can see them all individually and distinctly. Similarly, if you're unfolding something, you have a piece of paper that's been folded up. It's compressed. All the different sides and, and, and facets and, and uh, sides of it are pressed together but then you unfold it so we can see more of it at the same time so the purpose of close reading is not to decode or translate right you're not trying to find a one-to-one -one meaning that x word represents y other word 
or, or idea. But you're looking for multiple meanings. You're looking for implications. You're looking for uh, complexity. So, and another way to put this is that close reading is the first aspect of or the foundational part of reading between the lines. That is, what's being said without being said? What is this author trying to communicate without saying it explicitly? And so again, thinking about this, if you can close read a short story or a poem or a play, then how much better can you understand the unspoken messages when you're talking to your significant other or the unspoken messages when you're talking to your boss or your parents or the unspoken messages, again, that are coming through from a political speech. So that's why close reading is really, really important because it gives you that ability to read between the lines and see that, as I said in our very first uh, uh, introduction video, things are more complex than they appear at first. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou by the Indian Ganges side shouldst rubies find, I by the tide of umber would complain. I would love you ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. An hundred years should go to praise thine eyes and on thy forehead gaze, two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest. An age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For, lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. So we can start with the basic questions that we asked last time. What is the situation? What's going on? Who is talking to whom? What is this person saying and why are they saying it? And who is hearing it? And what are they, how might they be reacting to what they're hearing? So in this, the title tells us quite a bit, to his coy mistress. Now we have to know what the word coy means. Uh, if you don't know what coy means, um, well, you should, of course, look it up in a dictionary. Uh, but for our purposes, it means sort of flirtatiously shy. Uh, so someone who is shy and reserved, but also perhaps a little bit... Um, Again, flirtatious or, or interested, not totally uninterested. So what does that title suggest about the relationship between the two? Well, it's to his coy mistress, so at least from his perspective, she is his. Uh, and that, so that suggests a certain intimacy, that there's a previous, previously existing relationship. And if she's being coy, why might he be, be writing to her? What is he trying to get her to do? What is he hoping to accomplish? Well, maybe that she won't be so coy. That rather, instead of being flirtatious but shy, she'll lose the shy part and just be flirtatious and respond to his advances. So what does it suggest, perhaps, about his motivations? Well, perhaps they are romantic or sexual in nature. What seems to be the mood or tone of the first part? What emotions does the seekers, speaker seem to feel? Uh, and we can often figure this out through uh, images. So it talks a lot about love. That seems to be the primary emotion that's expressed or that's discussed. So what kind of mood does that create? What does that give us a sense of the emotion with which he's delivering these words? And what does he say about this coy mistress? What does his attitude towards her seem to be? How does he feel towards her? Again, the title tells us something. He's interested in her, perhaps, attracted to her, but also feels that she is being shy. And of course, finally, what does he say about himself? How does he position himself relative to her? How does he present himself to her? So these are all questions to think about in terms of this poem, but any text that you're reading. What we've got here is just a basic paraphrase of the text of this first stanza. That is, turning it into more standard English in terms of its language and syntax, what would the person be saying? Well, basically, 
that first stanza would go something like, if we had all the time and space in the world, as much as we needed, then it wouldn't be a big deal that you're being shy. Your shy behavior would not be a problem. We could spend as much time as we want just thinking about what we're going to do. We could sit, sit around, be lazy, relax, think about how we'd pass the time together. You could go as far as the opposite side of the world to the Ganges River and, and look for rubies if you wanted. And I would stay here and just complain about how much I miss you. And if we had all the time and space in the world, I would have loved you from beginning of time, since before Noah's Ark, back in pre-recorded history. And then you could keep playing hard to get and refusing me until the end of time, until the apocalypse, judgment day wouldn't be a problem if we had all the time and space in the world. And my love for you would just grow and grow like plants that grow and keep growing forever and ever, like a forest that just creeps over the whole world, like an empire that takes decades and centuries to build, but covers the whole world. And I love you so much that I would spend a hundred years just talking about how beautiful your eyes are and your face, just looking at that. And then I would spend 200 years each describing how beautiful each of your breasts are. And then I would spend another 30,000 years describing how beautiful the rest of your body is. I would spend an age, an eternity, millennia on each part of you and at the end of that time of describing all of you, you'd show your true feelings, you'd give me your heart and your, your love. Because you are so wonderful that you deserve all of that love. And I love you so much that that's what I want to give you. Now it's time to go through in that detailed fashion, like we did for our first analysis papers, and really investigate line by line, sentence by sentence, phrase by phrase, what this uh, speaker is saying, what ideas he's expressing. Had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady were, were no crime. Well, we should note that he's starting with an if, right? An implied if, if we had world enough in time. But of course, we don't. Or maybe we don't, that seems to be the implication. Now, what is it that he's complaining about? What is his problem? What is this, the problem that's provoking him to speak? Well, she's being coy. She's refusing him. And notice that he calls it a crime. What is meaningful about that? Well, it's certainly not literally a crime. He's not saying literally she's breaking the law. But it gives us a sense of his feeling towards her behavior. He doesn't like this. He wishes she would respond. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. So what's the mood here? What's the tone of these lines? What actions is he portraying? Very simple actions. Sitting down, thinking, walking, passing time. So these are not very active actions, so to speak. These aren't things that, that involve a lot of energy. There's a slowness, a gentleness a calmness, a peacefulness to these words. So this suggests that, you know, again, in this fantasy of world enough in time, they could be very calm. Things could be relaxed and they could sit around thinking, well, what are we going to do today? What are we going to do tomorrow? And notice that metaphor, long love's day. He presents this whole eternity as a single day. It would be just like waking up on a Sunday and deciding, what are we going to do? But it's a Sunday that we have forever. Thou, by the Indian Ganges side, shouldst rubies find. So what do you think is significant about locating it in the Indian Ganges? What associations might that have if you are in the West, if you are in England? You might find it to be exotic, certainly distant, alien. It's associated here with rubies, so it's associated with wealth, beauty, riches. 
perhaps he's uh, what's the word I'm looking for perhaps he is flattering her a little bit or trying to appeal to her vanity by saying offering her these gifts that she could find saying well I know that you love beautiful things so you could go get these rubies by the Indian Ganges side and it's significant that she's so far away and again, this is things would be fine. It wouldn't be a big deal for us to be apart, for you to be so far away, if we had world enough and time. I, by the tide of umber, would complain. So this is the counterpart to her off in the Ganges. He would be still here at home in England by the very humble umber river. And he would just be complaining, right? What's the action that he's performing here? He's saying, oh, I miss my lady love. She's so far away. But notice how he portrays himself. He's saying it would be fine for you to be so far away. And I would happily complain about how much I miss you. Because, why? Because they have eternity. And so that distance that's between them She's on one side of the globe, he's on the other. What's important about it? Why does he bring it up? Well, perhaps to say, again, that distance would be nothing to me if we had everything in the world, if we had the whole world to ourselves. No matter how far away you were, I would know that we would eventually be reunited. I would love you ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till, till the conversion of the Jews. Now, these are, of course, biblical references. If you're not familiar with them, the first is about the story of uh, the flood when God in the Hebrew Old Testament uh, drowns the world for its wickedness and saves uh, only Noah and his family and a select group of animals in their ark. And it symbolizes a prehistorical event. It's ancient. It's so far back in time. And the speaker says, I would have loved you even before then. So what is he saying about the nature or intensity of his love? How is he promoting himself or presenting himself to the woman? And this reference to the conversion of the Jews, that's an idea in the Christian New Testament that at the end of time one of the final things that will occur before of the apocalypse and judgment day etc etc is that uh, all the Jews will convert to Christianity um, and so why is he referencing these biblical references well they serve as useful references for way back in the past and way in the future that people would know but also, not that he's saying his love is religious, but he's giving it a certain religious overtone by mentioning it. Notice again the actions. What's happening? He's loving, she's refusing. That relationship has been established. That he loves her, pursues her, desires her. She refuses, plays hard to get, plays coy, runs off to the Ganges. And he's saying it wouldn't be a big deal. It would be fine. You could keep refusing me till the end of time. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. So think about the ideas that are inspired by this. This vegetable love, an odd phrase. He doesn't mean vegetables in the sense of the kind of food that you would go and buy in the vegetable section of your grocery store, but he means vegetation, plant life. So his love is like, there's something plant-like about it. Think about how plants grow and the images associated with growing plant life or the ideas associated with it. The idea, that idea itself of life and continuous renewal and rebirth of life. And how do plants grow? Well, they usually grow very slowly, but continuously. If you leave an area alone and you don't come back to monitor or uh, uh, cut the plant growth, 
remove it, it'll just keep growing over and over and over. Vaster than empires, vaster than these va political entities, human political entities where there's multiple kingdoms that span the globe, his love would cover over even that. So what is he saying about himself? How is he presenting himself? What persona is he taking on? What kind of lover is he saying that he is to this woman? And what effect is he hoping that it will have on her by saying these things? Here is where the speaker's motivations may become most obvious to us as modern readers, although we shouldn't necessarily be too quick to judge him based on our own sense of what's proper to say to someone that you're courting. An hundred years should go to praise thine eyes and on thy forehead gaze, two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest, an age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. So what is he literally saying he would do? He's saying, I would tell you how beautiful your eyes are, and I could do that for a hundred years. That's how beautiful your eyes are, and so on with the other body parts. So he's saying how much he would flatter her and how he would praise her in poetry, just like he's doing here. So what effect is this ca being calculated to have? What does he hope it's going to have? Uh, to show her again how much he loves her, that he does desire her, and that he's dedicated to her. And he would happily spend 30,000 years if he could live that long just praising her. Now we might notice what body parts he mentions and doesn't mention here. Starts with the eyes and forehead. That's fine. That's good. But then he very quickly goes to the breasts, which might seem to us to be a little uh, presumptuous and a little uh, sexually harassing. Um, and it is. This shows us what was appropriate 300 years ago, 400 years ago, in terms of speaking to a woman, is probably not appropriate today, uh, because he is objectifying her. He's saying, look at how beautiful your body is, as though that is the only thing that's important to her. But this is, of course, calculated to flatter her, so this is something that a woman uh, would expect to be flattered on in this time. And notice how he says, eyes, forehead, breasts, and then the rest of you. Now, we might imagine, given what his uh, romantic goals are, which body parts he's most concerned with out of that rest. But he very specifically does not mention it. He's smart enough not to say that in particular. But it is included in there. It is implied that he would spend a lot of time worshipping it, praising it, or the rest of her. Um, and that is both praising it with words, and perhaps also the suggestion that he would praise her body uh, physically should they consummate their relationship. And notice, as I've said here, where does his gaze begin and where does it end? Where do his eyes start? Again, they start at the top of the body and then they move lower, forehead, eyes, breasts, and then we don't get to see the eyes move any lower. And where does it end? Well, where do we think he wants to end? Perhaps there's a specific physical place in her body that he hopes to end, but he ends ultimately at her heart, which is internal within her uh, and, and a symbol for her essence, for her true identity. So he moves from the physical to the emotional or to the... Uh, spiritual, from body, eyes, forehead, breasts, to heart. And the final lines of the stanza, For lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. So what is he saying about himself? That's, this is how much I love you. I love you enough to spend thousands of years just praising your body. That's how dedicated I am to you. And what does he say about her? This is what you deserve. You are beautiful enough to deserve all of this. So his approach here, he's being very flattering, right? If we were to say, what 
actions is he performing in this first stanza? He's flattering the woman. He is expressing his love for her. He's flattering himself by presenting himself as such a devoted, dedicated, and true lover. So how does this fit with his overall intentions? Again, if his intention is somehow to get her to succumb to his courtship, then this is part of presenting himself as a worthy lover and flattering her as someone whom he truly cares about and values. Now we're on to the second stanza, which I will move through a little bit quicker. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honor turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. So what's the change in tone in this second stanza? I think obviously it's much darker, right? Images of time passing, death, the grave, worms, dust. It's a much gloomier tone, much darker tone. What and how does his argument change? Well, if the first stanza had been if we had all eternity, the second stanza is but we don't. So what is how is his argument developing here? Uh, what sorts of images does he use? Again, I've mentioned some of those. Time, time's chariot, uh, the marble vault of the tomb, worms, dust, the grave, very dark, gloomy images. Right? So what effect is he trying to have on her? What actions is he trying to perform? If in the first stanza it was to flatter her, to show himself as so loving and worthwhile, etc., etc., now it is a very different effect maybe to warn her, to scare her, to even disgust her a little bit, to disturb her. And how does this fit in with his ultimate goal to his coy mistress? But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. What emotion is he experiencing in that moment? Think about that image, time's winged chariot hurrying near. And where is it? It's at his back. It's behind him. So how would that feel to hear times, and it's not just times chariot, it's its winged chariot hurrying near. So what is about to happen to you? What are you afraid is going to happen to you? You're going to be run over by times chariot, which would mean what? Death. You're running out of time. You never know when you will be out of time. It's always behind you, and it's going to catch up to you at any moment. Again, I've noticed that but at the beginning of the stanza. How does that continue or develop the thought from the first stanza, right? The first one had been, if this we had world enough in time. Now he's saying, but we don't. Right? But what is the real situation? Well, we don't have all the time in the world because time is running out. And we don't have all of the world because yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. So think of the image of a desert, an eternal, unending desert. What image, what mood does that evoke? What emotions does that make you think? And what in particular does that contrast with in the first stanza? Can you think of what images this might oppose or be, be set up in opposition to? Perhaps most obviously that image of the vegetable love, instead of this love that grows and grows eternally over time, we have nothingness, eternity of death, of dryness, of a lack of life. So rather than an eternal infinity of love and life imagined in the first stanza, we have just an eternity of nothingness in front of us according to the second stanza. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault 
shall sound my echoing song. So what is he predicting about the future? What will happen to each of them? Well, when she grows old, she'll lose her beauty. We can see, obviously, that this is a poem from a masculinist point of view. Right? What is the woman valuable for? Her beauty. Uh, that seems to be the speaker's assumption. And when she loses that beauty, what will she have? Right? She will have nothing left. Perhaps also a warning to her, saying, hey, you are beautiful now, but in the future, you won't be anymore. And now I sing this poem to you. I love you. I praise you. But when you've lost your beauty, when you've aged, when you've died in your tomb, I won't be singing to you any longer. So they will both change and their relationship will change. This intimacy, this connection they have will be gone. So what is the speaker trying to do here? Right? Is he warning her? Is he trying to frighten her? Is he trying to almost offer something of an ultimatum to her? If you don't watch out, this is what's going to happen to you. Then worms shall try that long preserved virginity. Um, so literally what is happening in this very, very disgusting and graphic image Right. Try, meaning test, put to trial. So the virginity, the coyness, the shyness that she has been uh, engaging in, her resistance to her lover's advances that she's preserved for so long, and that he says, if we had all of time, you could preserve it for as long as you wanted. What will happen to that in reality? Well, it will be eaten by worms. There's a rather grotesque sexual image here, which I will leave it to you all to imagine for yourself. But you get the sense of what sickening image he's trying to portray to her. And why is, would he do this? What effect is he trying to have? Well, again, it seems to be almost to terrify and disturb her. Yes, you are very proud of your virginity and your, and your coyness now, but what matter will that be when you're dead and you lose your virginity to the worms that eat your corpse? It seems to be almost even mocking, perhaps, really undermining her sense of the importance of this virginity. But she continues in the next lines, And your quaint honor turned to dust and into ashes all my lust. Right, This honor that, that you're so proud of, it will be dust just like the rest of your body as you fade away, as you return to the earth that made you. And as you die, the lust that is firing me right now, that is burning inside me, will burn away into ashes. So what effect is he trying to have again? What is he predicting about their future relationship or what is he trying to suggest to her? Well, she will lose her virginity. She will lose her body, her beauty. She will be nothing more than dust. And he will no longer love her. He will no longer want her. So if she no longer has her beauty and no one wants her anymore, what worth is she? What does she have left? Nothing. So she is literally dead, and it's a sort of figurative death too. To lose one's beauty, to lose the love that people direct towards you is like a sort of death. In the final lines of the stanza, the grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. And I say it's a, it's a joke, right? He's sort of making a joke saying, yes, well, it is private in the grave. Um, it's a very nice place. It's, it's a holy place, uh, but it's not the place for love. So if you're holding out until then, you're making a mistake. The place for love is here now in the world that we're in. This is the place and time for love, not waiting until the end of time, waiting until you're dead and turned into decaying flesh. Now that I've gone through the first two stanzas, I'll leave it to you all to handle the third stanza and think about breaking this down 
um, thinking about what is going on, how is the speaker's argument being completed or developed. If the first stanza was if and the second stanza was but, this third stanza is therefore, so what is the completion of his argument? What images does he employ in this final stanza? Uh, what is his mood? How does he express himself? What does he say about her and what he sees in her? What actions does he propose? What does he say that they should do? And what does he offer as the solution to their original problem? If the original, if the problem is she's coy and they don't actually have all of eternity, what is the solution he offers? Now, therefore, while the, the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball, and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. So think about what we've done over the last few slides, the process that I've taken you through, the kinds of questions that I've asked and the answers that I've proposed, and think about your own answers to these questions. And think about applying that process, that methodology, to this last stanza, and then, of course, to the other poems as you work on your responses and analysis papers. I will, uh, later on this week, post a second uh, close reading like this for one of the other poems, so be on the lookout for that. And if you have any questions, please contact, with, contact me uh, in any of the many ways that you know how. And I look forward to reading your work this week.